Yeah, I hope you got a good coffee and uh, some interesting talks during the break. And I would like to welcome you now to the panel discussion. So we have uh, five panelists here. This is uh, Günter Paurich from the Austrian Energy Agency in Austria and uh, Uwe Fritsche from the INAS in uh, Germany. We have Hendrik Thunmann. I don't have to introduce him because you have seen him already. And uh, we have Andreas Wolf from the Austrian Biomethane Registry. So the question we would like to discuss here today is how can we accelerate the market uptake of biomethane? And of course, how can we accelerate the implementation of uh, biomethane plants in Europe and worldwide, of course? Uh, most of the panelists here are from Europe, so I think we will focus a little bit on the European situation. And we have planned this now in a way that uh, we will give all the panelists a five-minute statement. First of all, I would like to ask you to introduce yourself, give a short introduction to yourself, and then state what is your opinion on how can we speed up biomethane technology in Germany and in the world. And I would like to start with Günther first. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Günther Paurich. I'm from the Austrian Energy Agency, and I'm uh, head of a center for energy economics and infrastructure at the Austrian Energy Agency. And this is a center in which we are focusing on different topics regarding the transition of the energy system towards climate neutrality. And for this first input, I have brought three short slides, which me, we maybe can show now. Uh, can we show the slides? And I have to uh, admit a terrible mistake. I forgot, of course, a representative from the internet. It's uh, Juliana Kanchian, and she is uh, from the European Biogas Association, and she will also take part in this panel discussion. Welcome, Juliana, and I hope you forgive me that I forget you. And no problem. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I want to show you some of the key findings of a study that we have developed on behalf of the Austrian Ministry for Climate Protection. Uh, and in this study, we were working together with colleagues from the Energy Institute at the University of Linz and colleagues from the Montana Universität Leoben. And the focus of this study was uh, to make a quantitative estimation of the demand and domestic supply of renewable gas in Austria. And uh, the focus that we had was, on one hand, an estimation of the demand of renewable gases in 2040, which is the year in which Austria shall become climate neutral, uh, according to the uh, targets of the Austrian governmental program. And our estimation was focused on three hard to abate sectors. On one hand, the industrial sector, uh, including the material use uh, of renewable gases. So we were focusing on, for instance, iron and steel production, glass making, uh, and the chemical industry. The next sector was the transport sector, uh, in which we were focusing on road transport, uh, and also on aviation, which was the part which uh, brought us to the largest amount of, of, of demand for, for renewable gases because of the necessary production of, of liquid e-fuels. And finally, as we also have to decarbonize the electricity supply system, we had to take a look on the combined cycle heat and power plants and the use of uh, renewable gases for electricity and district heating. This was the the one part regarding the demand, and on the other side, we try to uh, estimate which potentials can we realize until 2040 uh, uh, for uh, biomethane, on one hand from anaerobic digestion, and on one hand, on the other hand, from the gasification of solid biomass, uh, which was one of the very interesting aspects when you consider that Austria is a country with. Uh, about 50% of the area covered with forests, uh, with a very large wood processing industry uh, and, and much of paper industry in Austria. And when we took uh, the, the result is that in general we have a very 
high theoretical potential for uh, the pyomethane, which is 88 terawatt hours, most of it coming from the gasification potentials, which of course are theoretical, because when you try to estimate the potential which you can really real, realize uh, until 2040, you see that it's only about 20 terawatt hours, which is less than a quarter of the, this theoretical uh, uh, potential that we have identified in this project. And the a little bit depressing issue on the other hand is when we have to take a look at the uh, at the demand in 2040, and for this demand we have estimated two different scenarios. One is a scenario which we call the use of infrastructure a scenario, which is more focusing on remaining in the use of existing uh, infrastructure, and we have uh, estimated a lower uh, uh, progress in, in research and development, so which uh, this is a scenario which with, with, with more focus on existing structures and a, a slower development. On the other hand, we have a scenario, we call it exergy efficiency, which is a scenario where we really are focusing on a fast forward approach for the use of renewable gases and a clear focus in the use of renewable gases in high temperature processes where you really need the uh, different possibilities, the, the clear good possibilities of renewable gases. And what we can see is that the majority of the demand will come from the industrial, uh, the industrial sector, which stands for about 75% of the demand in 2040, with the focus, as I mentioned before, iron and steel production, glass making, chemical industry. Uh, and the other ones are, of, are also important, but the demand is significantly lower than from the industrial sector. What we can see, even if we would try to focus on the exergy efficiency scenario, the gap between the production from biomethane and the need for renewable gases in general is nearly 70 terawatt hours. And in the other uh, case, the second scenario, it's even 118 terawatt hours. And this gap has to be filled with uh, the input of renew renewable gases on one hand and additional production coming from uh, green electricity for the production of green hydrogen. So with these view figures that I've showed you, uh, I've shown you, you can see that Austria has to face a very, very high challenge to deal with this situation uh, and which gives us also uh, the, the, the look in the future which says that we have to focus on these hard to abate sectors, sectors. It will be challenging enough to cover the demand of these sectors, and we have to avoid the use of renewable gases in other sectors, which have other possibilities for decarbonization, which is especially true for the room heating sector. Thank you. This is my first small input for this discussion. Thank you. Yeah, okay. if you want. Yeah, so I thought I got my uh, minutes before. But what I see is the most uh, important is to, if I look on the process that I showed you, when you split up the biomass into the gases, you get around 25-30% as methane all together from the beginning. The rest is more or less syngas, and for me the syngas could be used to a higher value product. So I would say that one should look on the biomass as resources and see how one best utilize them. And then if I do this kind of work and not having regulation that compete with each other, I showed you, for example, the HVO that out totally take out the biogas uh, production in Sweden. and, and Whenever we have regulation that makes it possible for uh, an Valsi region to, what we talk about here as well, import from other regions to make its own, you, you take away uh, this type of uh, process. I talk about the gasification technologies because they need to be in large scale. You need to do a lot of investment. And if you can import your, yourself away from that, they will never happen. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Uwe Fritsche, I also have a few slides to share with you. I hope we can bring those up. <clears throat> OK. 
Can anyone do that? Yep. All right. Um, I'm a physicist by training. Um, I work for IEA Bioenergy Task 40, um, where I lead. Um, and we had the pleasure in the last couple of years um, to look into a project which we called Renewable Gas. Um, it's an inter-task project, so several colleagues uh, have contributed to that from other tasks. Uh, we looked into all of the renewable gases, including hydrogen. I think that was the, the key challenge for us uh, coming from the bioenergy side. Um, one thing I guess you all are aware of the um, net zero study from the IEA uh, from last year, uh, where the role of the various gases, uh, which are hopefully renewable, um, are shown. Um, I have put one up here, one, one small graph, where you see from 2020 to 2030 to 2050 the dynamics, and you see the dark bar, uh, which is biomethane, and that is a global figure. Right? That's not for Austria, that's not for Germany, that's not for Europe, that's for the world. Um, and there you see that the, the significant contribution up to 2050 will be from biomethane, not from hydrogen. Uh, I think that's important to, to uh, keep in mind. On the other hand, uh, we all know <coughs> that uh, we can do a lot with uh, biomass. We can also have uh, carbon negative options and carbon neutral options. Um, and they should be considered also uh, biogas upgrading as, as a source of valuable products and not just energy. I think that's quite important uh, to, to consider in future markets. If you look to the German situation where there is a lack of CO2 for the breweries, for beer brewing, uh, that gives you a taste what uh, the future of CO2 could look like. On the other hand, <clears throat> we found in the work where we looked into a couple of countries, you see here a list, um, really an, a significant amount of obstacles, not technical ones. I think that's what I want to underline. <clears throat> the technical side, uh, the innovation part is, is covered quite well uh, all over the planet. Um, but on the, on the governance of the sector, how could you actually implement, there's really a lot. And the most relevant uh, issue here is the uncertainty we see in the medium to longer term dynamics of the markets, which the, the Ukraine war, the Russian-Ukraine aggression uh, is only part of the game because it's, that's clearly an issue. How will the climate change policies take up? How strongly will a carbon signal be part of a longer term price in the energy market? That's an unknown in the moment. Um, and that brings a lot of uh, um, uncertainties into the investment side. So even if a technology looks attractive and competitive, uh, that doesn't mean uh, that it will be taken up by the market as such. And that's especially true for the biomethane, which in principle nowadays is competitive. Um, on the other hand, the policies uh, yeah, look for renewable gases in the moment at least, I would say, uh, look a lot uh, to in, into hydrogen, green hydrogen hopefully, um, coming from renewable sources. Biomass is one of the options. Um, you would lose a lot of uh, heating value going down uh, to hydrogen or going up to hydrogen. Um, but there's many, many other uh, electricity options, especially renewable electricity options. And countries are going in that direction. I think you all are aware of the activities uh, in the United States, in Japan, um, in Europe, um, less so in Latin America, but that may <coughs> come up with, for example, Chile. Um, the indication is that we, see, just to compare that to the figures we saw for Austria, right? Um, an order of a thousand terawatt hours of hydrogen, which may be around in 2050, a thousand terawatt hours on this planet, coming from green electricity mainly. And that is clearly a competitor um, to the situation we have with biogas and biomethane um, in a sense of the market introduction. Policies nowadays focus on the market introduction, if ever, <coughs> for hydrogen. And with that, I guess the focus is a little bit less on the side of the biomethane. We have one good exception, that is uh, the European debate we have uh, this, um, early this year on the EU power. And I think that's something where we see a significant focus on the biomethane and a, a longer term perspective <coughs> on uh, the hydrogen, which I think is quite reasonable. If you want to learn more about it, here are the two links. Uh, you can download this later. Um, it will be on the IEA website. 
And there you can read a lot of uh, the cases we have looked into in several countries. Uh, I won't go into details. I just want to give you a summary. So we have technologies to do it. Um, we have to do it in the next couple of years. But the huge uncertainty is something which calls for um, a regulatory um, approach to it. And that's where the obstacles are. We don't have a, a sound global uh, thing yet. Um, but I think we are going in the right direction, at least with, with the Euro, on the European side. And uh, let's hope for the best. Thank you very much for this uh, great introduction so far. Um, my name is Andreas Wolf. I work for HGCS Biomethane Register as a project manager for now almost uh, 11 years. And uh, today I want to talk shortly about uh, renewable gas certificates because uh, most of the comments and statements and presentations we had today uh, were on uh, some uh, industrial processes, some theoretical or regulatory parts. And uh, I come now from the practical side in order to allow industrial producers, uh, traders and other entities on the gas market to transfer this uh, renewable volume from a producer to a final end customer independent of the application itself, whether this will be an industry or transport sector or maybe the electricity or end consumer sector. Uh, as a Austrian biomethane registry, uh, we are creating certificates on a monthly level. So this is our main part uh, to document the renewable value of uh, biomethane for volumes which are injected into the Austrian market areas gas grid. Uh, we handle about 50 market participants uh, which are traders, auditors, uh, plant operators of biomethane uh, production facilities or electricity production facilities. Um, our main focus is that the renewable gas is properly certified. Uh, we provide a system to do uh, this uh, by auditors and it can be used for various purposes uh, in the Austrian biomethane registry, particularly for the subsidy of renewable electricity. Uh, we also see that uh, cooperation are necessary to exchange those uh, certificates between registries and also between countries. So we have formed at the moment two cooperation, one in Austria with the biofuel registry of the environmental agency and uh, we have a European cooperation with uh, EAGA in order to exchange renewable gas certificates uh, cross-border. Uh, on the uh, right uh, part of the slide, you see that the biomethane production is continuously decreasing in Austria. There are various reasons for it. I don't want to go into it. It's not the uh, certification part. Uh, it's the regulatory part, but we hope that this will increase in the future tremendously. When we talk about certificates, I just want to give you an introduction how difficult it can be because uh, most of the uh, people uh, think that uh, certificates can be traded. There's just one certificate. Everybody knows there's just one value. It has a price of 30, 40, 50. Everybody knows what is included. That's not the case. A uh, certificate can be very complex. Uh, why? Because it can include different layers. Uh, at the top you can see that at the moment we have uh, certificates for a voluntary market because there are lots of different end uh, users at the moment um, which are not uh, regula regulated um, on a European level, particularly national subsidy schemes. They are totally independent uh, in each different EU country. For example, in Austria we have none subsidies for biomethane itself. Uh, we have it only for the electricity production uh, uh, if you use biomethane. 
But uh, we see on the European level that there are uh, regulatory frameworks established um, for consumer disclosure in the Renewable Energy Directive, uh, which uh, allows to document renewable gases for the end customer, in particular in the heating uh, sector. And we see in the transport sector that uh, when we have seen today liquid uh, biofuels, but we will also see gaseous biofuels. We will shortly see in the future sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, there is the necessity to uh, document those volumes uh, properly with attributes allowing to account it for targets, uh, whether this is just a quota or a volume or some other entities. And uh, especially for the transport sector, uh, we have established a European organization uh, called uh, ERGA, the Renewable, Renewable Gas uh, Registry, which already includes uh, 34 members. And we as AGCS are a major part of it, as we allow already for a cross-border exchange with uh, then with uh, the German registry from DINA uh, with the UK, which has been already uh, mentioned today, and also with Netherlands, which is operated by Vertogas. And uh, shortly in the future, we will see also Denmark and France uh, joining uh, the cross-border movement. And uh, as such, uh, the acceleration, I think, of renewable gases can only happen if there is a way of exchanging uh, volumes also cross-border but not uh, multiple count those volumes in different uh, member states for different sectors or for different um, producers. And uh, this is a major part which we as AGCS uh, play a role and uh, will also play in the future to allow for a proper documentation and movement of renewable gases in Europe. Thank you. Then the last uh, opening session is Julia Cancian, your uh, remote, so from the European Biogas Association. If you could do your opening statement. Hello, yes, indeed. Uh, will you share my presentation or should I do it uh, from my side? If you can do it, I think you can uh, share your presentation. Okay. Thank you for bearing uh, with me uh, in this moment. And um, um, yeah, my name is Julia Canchan. I'm from the European uh, Biogas Association. And in my five minutes, I will try to answer to this question. So what we need to accelerate the deployment of renewable gases. Uh, so first thing first, so we start with, a, I, I think, a positive note that was touched already upon uh, by the keynote speaker of today. On the 28th uh, of September, uh, together with um, the, uh, the Executive Vice President Timmermans and Commissioner Simpson, uh, the Biomethane Industrial Partnership uh, was launched and uh, the technical launch of this partnership will take place uh, in a, a bit more than one week time uh, in Brussels uh, on the 25th of October. Uh, but where we are compared to the, the Biomethane Action Plan and, uh, and the objective that the, the indicative objective that this includes, so uh, the production of 35 uh, billion cubic meters, uh, by 20, uh, by 2030. So, um, in the, first of all, we needed to acknowledge that, uh, the biomethane action plan and the repower you represent a positive step, uh, and also gives uh, a good push to the market to roll out more capacity uh, in the near future. But, um, there are four, uh, pillars, uh, that we need to unlock, uh, in order to, um, uh, to fasten the, uh, the production of renewable gases and in particular biomethane. Um, some of my fellow speakers today touched upon uh, different regulatory issues that are uh, still uh, blocking a little bit the market and also some opportunities that are coming from the production of biomethane. 
So the first uh, important pillar, in our opinion, is the planning. Uh, so we would like to see uh, the 35 billion cubic meters of biomethane anchored to uh, European and national legislation to make sure that there are solid trajectories and milestones to achieve the target. Um, the, as we will uh, see in a minute, uh, the member state uh, will have to uh, retouch their national energy and climate plans and uh, seeing a specific trajectory for biomethane would be a very good start for the market. The second block is the market. So we need to ensure uh, easy market access. Uh, so this is uh, pertaining really the regulatory sphere, cutting red tape, eliminating persisting internal market barriers, and also uh, on the uh, policy side, making sure that uh, the internal market design for gas is adequate uh, to, to welcome renewable gases. Finance uh, is the third block, so uh, using dedicated and innovative finance instruments to mitigate risks. And we saw from uh, the presentation of the keynote speaker today uh, that there will be um, uh, very soon new instruments uh, to, to push the market in the right direction. And fourth, and very important, sustainable feedstock. So we need to make sure that we tap into sustainable resources such as waste, urban wastewater and sustainable crops. Where we are at the moment, so in 2020, uh, the European industry uh, produced uh, 18 billion cubic meters of combined biogas and biomethane uh, from uh, a bit less than uh, 20,000 plants. Uh, this is uh, quite a considerable amount. We're talking about 4.6% uh, of the EU gas consumption. And um, this is taken from a gas for climate study that was published in, in this July. And it shows that uh, the sector has the potential to deliver uh, 35 billion cubic meters of uh, biomethane by 2030. And untapping uh, those resources that are not creating uh, additional land demand and uh, sustainable ones. Uh, so we are counting specifically on uh, animal manure, agricultural residues and sequential crop. Uh, but also on industrial and urban wastewater. As I was saying before, the member states are gearing up now to rewrite their national energy and climate plans to take into consideration the further need to uh, make Europe more energy sovereign. And uh, in order to do this, uh, there are several steps that need to be integrated in their uh, in their new plans when it comes to um, to biomethane specifically. Uh, it's important to include a national vision, uh, planning accordingly, identify where the potential lays, where the demand lays, uh, but also enable through supporting policy and market development and, and, and trading um, the, the further rollout of the market without forgetting public uh, acceptance and uh, the mobilization of the supply chain. Um, and uh, now I will show you this slide. You will uh, for sure recognize uh, the, the overall uh, model of anaerobic digestion. But now I will pair it uh, with the incoming uh, legislative uh, drivers uh, that we will see in the next, uh, um, I would say, months. So first of all, on the energy side, uh, the Fit for 55 package in Europe has been discussed, uh, covering all the targets for energy and climate. When it comes to co-products such as Digestate, uh, we are waiting for a revision of the fertilizer product regulation, a soil health law, but also an integrated nutrient management plan. When it comes to uh, biogenic CO2 and its opportunity, the Sustainable Carbon Cycle Initiative should take form by the end of this year with maybe some standardization of how to account for negative emissions and how to uh, use in, in a more uniform way uh, the certifications. And when it comes to input, uh, so the feedstock, we're waiting for um, an update of the Annex uh, 9, uh, which identifies uh, the advanced feedstock for biofuels and biomethane as well. And also uh, we will see very soon a revision of the Waste Framework Directive and the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive that represent also two possible drivers uh, for further uh, biomethane production. Uh, so thank you. Thank you.
Then we would like to open uh, the floor for first questions from the audience, uh, both online or here in the room. If there is a question, please raise your hand in the back. Is there a microphone? Yes, thank you. Good morning. I have a question for Mr. Parich and a remark for Mr. Fritscher. My name is Felix Papsch. I'm from the Department of Environment and Technology from the Association of the Austrian Cement Industry. And as the cement sector, we recently drafted our roadmap and, uh, where we show how we reach carbon neutrality by the year 2050. And one of those measures in there is the use of renewable gas. Now you showed uh, that you made some estimations on how much renewable gas will be needed by the, by the industry sector. My question would be if the cement industry was included in this analysis. It was mentioned iron, steel, glass and chemicals, uh, but you were also speaking about industry. Was it as a whole or was it only these three sectors? Yeah, I, I only mentioned the three main sectors, but we also had a look at the, at the cement industry because we know that also this is one of the sectors which will be very hard to abate the, the CO2 emissions. Okay, thank you very much. Very good. Another thing was, I think it's a very important discussion. Um, on uh, This brings you to the remark for the second presentation. Uh, you showed that with biogenic energy capture, as a carbon capture and storage, you can create negative emissions. However, you mentioned when you do the same thing for products, the biogenic energy CCU version, emissions would only be neutral. I was wondering if this is true because there indeed are products where CO2 can be stored permanently. There are ways to create cement, there are ways to create a concrete where the CO2 will, remain, will, remain, will be there forever. And there is also an emission trading scheme already accounted, a form of uh, lime that is also possible to store CO2 forever. So what I want to say, there are products where CO2 remains forever away from the atmosphere. And I think the discussion should go also in this direction when we speak about BECCU. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> well the point I would like to make on, in response is uh, when we talk about negative emissions, then that is a net reduction of emissions from the atmosphere into some sort of reservoir, which is, as you mentioned, hopefully permanent or at least very long term. And in that sense, cement uh, and some other products could be a, a part of the game of BECS, right? Of the, of the sequestration. If we talk about use, that implies we do something like um, electrofuels, uh, we do plastics uh, from biogenic sources, we do oils and all kinds of stuff, um, which will be after a comparatively short time, something like 10 to 20 years, will be released again to the atmosphere. So I think that's that's the major uh, differentiation. So if you have a sequestration, something where you go for 100 years plus, um, that is something where we see it's it's not really use, it's sequestration. We don't have yet a, a global definition on what these terms mean. Uh, and that's part of the work we are ongoing, which is ongoing, where IEA Bioenergy contributes to. Um, and I think that's very important in the medium to longer term to actually allow for a good discussion and hopefully also trade um, of these kind of products. So like with the certificates you heard about, um, we also have the same problem on a broader scale uh, if we talk about renewable gases as such, including hydrogen and the various uses. Where, what does it imply in terms of greenhouse gas emissions? Uh, the European Union is in the process to set up rules, but they are hopefully, if they come soon, uh, they will be for the European Union, uh, but we envision a global trade, so that is something where we clearly need um, a better regulation. That was my plea. Yes, hello. <coughs> uh, good morning. My name is Kees Quant from the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. Uh, so my question is to the first speaker from the Austrian Energy Agency. You <coughs> presented a theoretical potential of 88 terawatt hour from, uh, let's say, uh, biomethane, but realizable only 20 terawatt hours. And it was not clear to me what is the difference between why is only, uh, why is not more, let's say, uh, re realizable? Yeah. Um, when we're looking at the theoretical potential, we collect all the possible resources which could be used 
for gasification of solid biomass. Uh, we do not look at the economy uh, of the processes at that level, and we do not look uh, on this level on the, on the issue which of these resources are already used in other sectors. And that's the problem, because we have a very large wood processing industry in Austria, we have pulp and paper industry, uh, and if you would try to use all these resources, of, of course you would get into large conflicts with other industrial sectors. And because of the economy on one hand, and on the other hand because of the, of the use in other sectors which is already at the time being existing, uh, we cannot uh, uh, calculate with such high theoretical resources and we cannot expect it. We can, we can really use them for the gasification of solid biomass. Are there, are there other questions from the audience? If, or, yeah, then there's one question and then I think we go to the, to the chat. There are also a uh, couple of questions. Peter Jolman from the UK. Have you any views on the relationship with food security and massively enhancing biomethane production? I'd be interested in whether that's coming up as a tension in, in the EU environment. Do you direct this question specifically to one person or just to the whole? Perhaps <laughs> if we start with the European Biogas Association lady, that would be a great place to start. Yeah, thank you. I'll be happy to take this question. Um, indeed, um, starting this uh, this spring, we started looking uh, more closely at uh, the potential of uh, of biomethane towards uh, 2030 and 2050, understanding whether we could uh, uh, actually satisfy uh, the Repower EU target and how to do so in the the most uh, uh, sustainable way. So the, the slide that you saw before was taken from a gas for climate study to which we cooperated. Um, and uh, the potential that I showed you before uh, towards 2030 is a sustainable potential that takes into account competition of uses uh, of the various feedstock. Uh, but most importantly, uh, starts from uh, the idea that uh, we should uh, pay more and more attention uh, to the sustainability of the feedstock that are uh, that are being uh, mobilized, and uh, also pushing for those uh, uh, untapped, I would say, sources of uh, of feedstock that are um, not creating any uh, any competition issues, uh, such as industrial wastewater, urban wastewater, and sludge. Um, but also continue working uh, with the agricultural work, with uh, which will. Uh, still constitute, uh, I would say, the most important cooperation for biomethane in the future, uh, mobilizing more manure, but at the same time um, uh, taking into account uh, the differences also in the animal farming that we will see uh, in the in the coming uh, 10 to 20 years. So the reduction of um, uh, of the number of uh, animal farming, for example, and uh, pushing more on the um, um, on the sequential crops model, uh, which uh, makes it possible to use the same land uh, for producing food and feed, and at the same time, uh, a suitable feedstock uh, for biogas, uh, covering the land and having, uh, a, a, I would say, a positive uh, positive externality on, uh, on the biodiversity and the soil quality as well. Thank you very much. Then I would hand over to Andrea and he will read some questions from the chat. Yeah, there's a question from the chat. It was mentioned that biomethane injected into natural gas grid may not earn recognition as green under national rules. How, what, how widespread is this and does it significantly hamper development of the biogas industry? What would be the ideal policy environment from the producer's perspective? Is it directed to somebody? Not or? specifically. Okay. I'm, I'm not aware of such a thing. I don't, I don't really understand that. Um, okay, okay. Um, I'll try to take over this question because um, theoretically not every biomethane, which is uh, with every gas volume which is injected into the grid per se is uh, renewable. 
Um, particularly when we see the biomethane plants, there may be a bio part, but it may not be sustainable according to other regulatory requirements. Uh, so uh, that's that's the reason why we say at the beginning for certificates we have a base certificate. It is a renewable gas certificate, but uh, by adding specific attributes through auditors, may it be some um, voluntary scheme auditors like ICC or Red Cert or maybe some national other auditors, you increase the value of the certificate to a level where the producer may say, "This is the value I need to get uh, uh, to finance the whole uh, project." Uh, so I think there are some necessary steps also on the European framework necessary because each different application has its different set on attributes and requirements and in the long run uh, we need to uh, reduce the complexity of uh, those different um, sectors and have one uh, renewable gas certificate which can be used for various purposes and potentially also provide on a market liquidity and a fair price uh, which can be traded first on a national, European and hopefully at some point on a uh, global level. Can give one of the comments as well. When when you look on this, as I give the example of the Guba gas plant, when it was up and running, it was not economically feasible in Sweden and Denmark, but it was would have been if it, it was on the border of Norway and would have been in the Netherlands, not in Germany. And this, I think, it's very much what we talk about here. If we cannot get into the subsidy schemes and the regulatory framework that is similar to everyone then you will have this, which is driven, mostly when you build this plant, is driven by some subsidy or some uh, innovation funding or something. And that if that becomes local, and then the local conditions change, <laughs> you get out of business. And that is, I think, is very devastating for any of this development. Is there another question, Andrea? Hi all, thanks so much for your, yeah, your inputs. Um, so my name is Charlene Vance and I'm doing a PhD on sustainability. Uh, and I have kind of a elephant in the room thing to say, which is that many studies show that uh, electrifying our system would be much more sustainable than continuing this uh, down the methane route and the natural gas grid and, and using that system. So I wonder what your thoughts are on, on why we should be even looking into uh, increasing uh, biomethane versus uh, producing electricity and then electrifying our, our system. Thank you. I can take one of the... If I look on it, is, uh, you are right. It, it, of course, one should electrify as far as possible. And... Uh, but if you look on uh, electrical grid into cities and and uh, peak demands and uh, different demands, it's uh, uh, you have very tricky to get actually the power if you're not getting both the electrical grid, the gas grid, and and, and complementing energy sources in. We have very little chance to actually sustain the energy balance of cities or regions. So we, we need to have a number of energy carriers. And if you look on the levels of in terawatt hours here that is suggested, the, the number of terawatt hours in the gas is not that huge compared to what we actually talk about in the electrification area. I think it's a very, very good question, um, which is unfortunately not easy to answer because it depends where you are in the world. Uh, and it also depends where you are in time. Um, if you go up to 2030, we have some understanding, I wouldn't say a good understanding, but some understanding how our electricity system will evolve all over the planet. And up to that time, up to 2030, we have pretty, pretty much opportunity uh, to talk about biomethane um, as a valuable contribution. Beyond that, um, the, the range of possible futures becomes a little 
becomes more fuzzy, let's say. And one, may, um, one major point there is the material side of our economies. Um, if we say we want to get rid of natural gas in all its applications, that means for fertilizer, but also for plastics, um, that takes a lot of biomass. Um, and at that time, after 2030, we may have, hopefully, uh, a very good offshore wind, onshore wind, PV, geothermal, you name it, uh, green electricity grid. And then it makes sense to say, okay, let's go for that. Uh, the other is, how does the hydrogen energy carrier comes into the game? Um, if you look for steel making, hard to abate, we heard, right? If you look to the chemical industry, hard to abate. Hydrogen could be a game changer, but to be a valuable uh, contribution, it needs to be green. And then again, electricity comes in. So there you have this kind of thing. The only two modes where we have some understanding in the moment, at least, is uh, aviation, long-term, long-range aviation, I should say, not regional, not national sh uh, short scale. Um, and the other is shipping, also international shipping. Um, and that is where um, some sort of bioenergy carrier can have a role. But the dynamics uh, in terms of ammonia and possibly also batteries and also sails, uh, wind energy, uh, is, is running up fast. So we, we don't know. In that sense, I guess it's a good strategy to not put all uh, your eggs in one basket, uh, but to kind of diversify. In that sense, biomass for energy is clearly a medium-term opportunity in pretty much all over the planet, with few exceptions. Um, in the longer term, as I said, we don't know, and that's why we say the bioeconomy, which includes the material use, food and feed, and so forth, uh, may be much better. And we heard about talking about more valuable products, right, from biomass than energy. Uh, that's hopefully a long-term vision to go through. If possible, I would also like to intervene. Um, so when we talk about uh, uh, electrification, uh, this is something that is happening and we know that uh, it's also important to decarbonization of our energy system. But I would like also to draw your attention of, uh, of the current situation in Europe uh, for at least a couple of, uh, of subsectors. When we look at uh, the heating sector, both for industrial uses and residential uses, um, the current rate of penetration of renewables in this sector is uh, around 21-22%, uh, at least in, uh, in, uh, in the year 2020-2021. Um, most of uh, the renewables uh, in, uh, in the heating sector were actually represented by uh, solid biomass uh, with a very little um, um, penetration of uh, of uh, the electrification and the rest. Uh, this is obviously changing, uh, but when we are talking about the share, so 22%, uh, once again, uh, I, th I think that there is a, a very interesting uh, share that we need to cover uh, for the uh, very close future. And um, the way we will decide what kind of technology will be working uh, for the sector and the others uh, will be, uh, should, should take into consideration uh, cost competitiveness on one side, um, and also uh, subsidiarity and uh, what kind of solution is best for the specific uh, region, climate, and uh, starting condition uh, that we're taking into account. And in this case, uh, biometer fits very well for uh, industrial solutions, but also uh, for residential heating in certain cases. Um, when it comes to transport, um, well, the, the previous speaker, uh, Mr. Fritsch, uh, was making some examples towards 2050, but we also need to look at the perspective of 2030 and as well as uh, 20, 2050. Of course, uh, shipping and maritime is a sector uh, that needs to be decarbonized and there's a long way to go. But I would also insist on the heavy duty vehicle sector, uh, which at the moment is lagging behind. When we look overall at the utilization of fossil fuels in the transport, sector. Uh, this is uh, the staggering majority, around 96-97%. Uh, so from, from the 3%, the current 3% in Europe, uh, to get to 100% decarbonization, I think there's a long way. Um, 
this to be saying that uh, in the next 10 to 20 and 30 years, there would be a need to uh, to push for all the possible solutions to get uh, to decarbonization. So electrification will count uh, for a big portion of that, but uh, other solutions such as biomethane and biogas will still be needed uh, in, in the medium and long term. Thank you very much. Many answers to one question. Um, Andrea, do you have another question? From the chat is, um, since the value of electricity depends on the time of day, it makes sense for a supplier to time their generation accordingly. What is the optimal amount of gas storage capacity for a given plant? <laughs> uh, I, I discussed this a little bit. I will I'll give try to give an answer here. I mean, first thing is, uh, if we talk about flexible operation, if we talk about having limited operational hours per year, you always have to think of uh, that you have idle investment sitting there. And this is uh, one of the major points I see with all this whole so plus electricity discussion that, that I'm not sure that we will really see that because that means that your electrolyzer is sitting there for most of the time and this is very expensive. Um, if you realize that because your electricity is really cheap and you have amounts uh, to go for that, then of course um, the question is where does this uh, changing electricity comes from? Is it only in the summer or is it in the winter? And you cannot store the gas for the whole uh, seasonal period. So gas storage then would be only interesting for a daily change, I would say. So then you might think of photovoltaics having during noon a lot of electricity and you store it. And then you run your electrolyzer most of the time, then you might not need a gas storage or you ramp up the electrolyzer during the day and then you might need a gas storage. But I think uh, these whole storage discussion also adds to the cost. And, and this is, I, I think 24 hours, seven days a week, this is uh, what is economically uh, most feasible and, and I would rather go for such a system. You can look on, you can compare it if you have the, the hybrid product which is going steel from hydrogen, from electricity. They um, look on like 7,000 hours of electrolyzers production and a two-week two storage of hydrogen. And that is the plan, that is the, the balance they do it. If I look on the electric fuel and so on, you, you, you usually come to that you have a sweet spot in the area between 50 and 70 percent where you come into the, the storage and so on, where you can see a, a lowest uh, balance between storage and electricity but this is uh, usually for uh, electric fuel uh, production uh, they can see that I, I also have a question is it working okay uh, Luke Pelicans from from IA bioenergy um, of course bio biomethane and biogas is not independent from from its co-products like uh, digestate and, and and fertilizer that can be produced from that. How do you see this interaction? Because you know, at the moment, uh, synthetic fertilizers are largely produced from, from natural gas, which is an issue which is getting extremely expensive. Um, how do you see this interaction between biomethane and, and uh, the fertilizers? Maybe to, to Julia, uh, Julia first. Uh, thank you, Luke, for bringing this up. Uh, this is a very close uh, interaction on one side. Uh, the utilization of, uh, of, uh, of digestate on soil can substitute to a large quantity uh, chemical fertilizers and have a positive impact on, uh, on the soil health. Um, and recently, uh, it was also underlined by several scientific studies that this can bring about uh, carbon storage. Um, so this is, uh, this is really relevant. Uh, we know that the interest in, uh, in digestate is growing in Europe also uh, due to um, the, the current situation with, uh, with fertilizers and, uh, and the, the peaking price uh, of, of this kind of input material. Um, at the same time, we need to make sure that uh, regulation is, 
is basically following uh, this development. The fertilizer product regulation entered into force uh, in member states uh, last July. And uh, it's, uh, it's a good piece of legislation because it brings uh, it opens the door to more nutrient recycling and to the possibility of utilizing digestate uh, as a fertilizer, but also to be commercialized uh, in Europe, adding up also to, um, uh, to the business case of, uh, of biomethane in general. At the same time, um, there are still some regulatory issues uh, with this uh, with this legislation because uh, not all the pieces of the puzzle are available at the moment. So some implementing um, uh, pieces of this regulation are still missing to date. Uh, we know that the Commission is working intensively on a, on a strategy uh, that uh, will be launched by the end uh, of this year on fertilizers and we hope that this will also point in the direction of more nutrient recycling and uh, the substitution of chemical fertilizers with other alternatives one uh, such as the digestate Thank you very much for that answer. I think uh, we have reached almost the end of our panel discussion here. I would like now to ask uh, our panelists to give a little uh, statement at the end to sum up a little bit um, what you think of the question. Maybe this has changed <laughs> in the last hour, I don't know. Uh, and then uh, I think we can wrap up. Oh. Andreas, there's one important question. Really left. broad uh, reflection um, in the chat on how to integrate social aspects into establishing and implementing innovative new technologies and processes. I don't know if. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think that's another hour. <laughs> Is there any short answer to that of you? As, as a scientist, I would say it's a great question. Uh, we are in a scientific institution. Uh, we have lots of them uh, all over Europe and there are many other places. So it makes this clearly a plea uh, to further research to take the social issues into account. It's part of the sustainability thing. It's not just the environment. Um, and we know, especially for the biomass debate, uh, that um, losing out of, of the, on the people is a terrible thing, right? It's, uh, we, we need the, not just the acceptance, but actually the partnerships. Uh, in that sense, the social part is clearly an important uh, component of a sustainable future from the research and hopefully after that also from the implementation. So in that sense, go ahead with it. Okay, then I hand over for the statement. Well, uh, maybe I can say something to the question of sustainability in the end. Uh, I think when we have to face the challenge to transform our whole economy and our whole energy supply system towards climate neutrality by the use of renewable energy sources, it's of course that electrification is one of the key factors and the key drivers for this. For this. But finally, we will need an overall energy supply system which is built strategically on different renewable energy sources and that's why biomethane and renewable gases will play a significant and important role in the future because electri even electrification is not the silver bullet to solve all the problems of the energy system in the future. Um, I give you one, one nice example as we are sitting here in this wonderful room with this perfect view over the city of Vienna. Uh, the city has about 2 million citizens, about 450,000 households directly use natural gas for room heating today, and another 450,000 households are using district heating in the city of Vienna, which is coming from gas-fired combined cycle heat and power plants. So there are more than 900,000 households in this city directly or indir indirectly using natural gas in the moment. Uh, and if you want to decarbonize only this heat supply in a large city like Vienna, I don't think that electrify all of that would be the appropriate solution for that. And this is the reason why we, as I mentioned in the beginning, also uh, consider renewable gases for CHP plants, not only to produce district heat for large cities, but also to have uh, 
electricity from renewable gases, especially in the winter time, where we can expect that there is significantly less production in the electricity part from solar PV, for instance, but also from hydropower, because this is the dry season of the year. And as from the Austrian perspective, a country which is already producing 75% of its electricity from renewables, I would say we need renewable gases and biomethane in the overall system and electrification will not be the silver bullet. Thank you. Okay, so then I ca you come to one in the area where we don't use natural gas, more or less. <laughs> so in, in Sweden we don't uh, have a natural gas grid, for example, and that was decided several years ago that we should not have it because of not lock-in effect, because it was not a uh, national resource. But when I look on the biomass and, and bioenergy in, in its whole, I think one of the big problem is that we always have talk about residues and waste material. And by now we come into a situation where all biogenic carbon is needed. And that means that there are no residues and waste material. And we need to look on all carbon in the same way. And uh, this means that we also need to look on them for, uh, from the sustainable point of view uh, uh, yeah, and, and put all that in the same basket for once. And, uh, because when I look in the Swedish perspective, there is a big drive actually to keep uh, forest residues, calling them forest residues and waste, because then they can be climate neutral as industry. And then you don't have to take in these other aspects, make creating a lot of problems in uh, the discussion on socialist acceptance and is there really sustainable or not. Well, I won't go into the greenhouse gas and climate uh, debate. I think that's worth another workshop at least. Uh, we had um, in collaboration uh, with others here in the room and outside of this room uh, already last year a good, a good series of workshops in that sense. I think it needs to be continued, right? It's, uh, it's, it's not something which is we can put a checkbox on. Um, but my view is that renewable gases have in one direction, a very good attraction in terms of near-termness, right? We can do something right now. We don't have to make adjustments to infrastructure. Um, if you use biomethane, uh, there's no need to do that, either on the, on the transport, storage, but also on the end use and appliances side. That's a value which is quite high in terms of speedy implementation. But on the other hand, um, we have the limitations we must acknowledge, right? So even if we use um, all of the sequential um, plant options we have in Europe, even if we say there is a change in food systems up to 2030 or even 2050, uh, biomass will only contribute, only contribute, uh, in the order of magnitude of 25 to 30 percent max, period. That's it, right? Uh, that's already, uh, I think, a, a rather substantial part and to, to get that down to earth and running is a huge job all over the place. Um, where do the other come from? Where does the other energy come from? I think that's the question, how about hydrogen? Is it coming from green electricity? Is it coming from blue sources? Whatever. Um, another discussion I think it's worth taking, but the important thing between that, is there an overlap? Is there a role um, in, a, in a future um, of hydrogen and bioenergy where they could be synergistics. And I think that's something worth exploring. We have started doing so. Uh, so I encourage you to follow IEA Bioenergy also over the next couple of years and see what interesting stuff we find out in this synergy debate. And my last point is, what about the demand side? Fortunately, uh, you mentioned that for Austria and we see that in Europe, but we also see this globally. If demand is not contained, but running away unrestricted, um, then this 25-30% would go down to something like 10%. So we need also a debate about the energy efficiency, about sustainability of demand. Um, just to give you one example, I tried very hard uh, to take a night train from where I live in Germany to Vienna. It shouldn't be a problem, you think. But from where I live, I cannot take a night train, right? So to arrive here, um, I have to fly. 
sustainable aviation fuels, not very much in the moment, right? Uh, so I think that is something where we have to consider, is there a limitation in terms of demand of aviation? Is there a need to bring goods all over the place, all over the planet, or can we do better? And that could bring some of the hard to abate sectors also down. And I think that should be part of the research, at least, uh, to look into a sustainable demand side option. And then the biomass, as part of the bioeconomy, uh, could play an important role. Well, difficult to finish after such a statement um, with certificates, um, but I'll try. Um, when we see all the percentages and a constantly increasing number of uh, renewables, uh, then it's clear that we will not turn from one point from to, from zero to 100 percent. So it will have some mixtures in between, and uh, those um, certificates uh, we provide to uh, the producers and to everybody will help in order to allow also for a proper handling of different targets. Are we on the right way? Do we need to focus on some other ways? And um, uh, this is a major part uh, we want to play uh, in Austria, also in Europe. And uh, our goal is also to make it as simple as possible in order not only to uh, allow market participants to understand uh, uh, renewable gases, but also at some point the uh, uh, society and uh, to, to understand uh, what we do and, and how uh, the proper documentation of those uh, values uh, can be accounted and for what. Julia, can you... Um... Yeah, um, so I, I will close uh, once again um, saying that in, in our opinion, it's uh, the, the target that the European Commission included in, uh, in its recent communication, Repower EU, and, and therefore uh, the, the willingness to scale up uh, the biomethane sector in the next uh, seven, eight years, and uh, even more so towards 2050. Um, it's it's a timely inclusion uh, and it's a reachable one, uh, but this will entail a big effort from the industry. Uh, and uh, we need to bear in mind that, that sustainability must be uh, the guiding light of, uh, of such a development for the sector. And uh, in order to, uh, to make this possible, uh, what we think we will need will be a, a multi-stakeholder uh, involvement and engagement and uh, making sure that uh, the agroecological transition is happening in our farms also through uh, the application of uh, and the utilization of biogas and biomethane as well as, uh, as its co-products. Uh, that uh, we push towards a uh, uh, nutrient uh, recycling and a virtuous management of, uh, of bio waste. And at the same time, uh, while the industry grows and develops, uh, we need to make sure that communities are kept on board. And this is um, a big uh, commitment that both regulators and the industry uh, must be taking in communicating and making sure uh, that the citizens are aware uh, of the projects that uh, will come up in the close future, but also of their direct benefits that they can um, uh, they can basically um, uh, develop on uh, on their uh, territory as well. So, thank you. So I think we come to uh, to our concluding statements. I will go first, and I think Jan will will end up. I have two observations. Um, well, there's probably more, but two that, that come to mind. First is the harmonization. I think in order to, to accelerate the deployment in Europe, we need to harmonize uh, on the gas side uh, the gas grid requirements. We hear that in Sweden, the Netherlands, France, uh, what goes into the grid is quite different. So uh, in order to speed up, it, it, it should be uh, harmonized. And secondly, the certificates. I think it would be very valuable if you could uh, produce in one country green gas and, and sell it in another country via a nice European certification system. The second observation is that the 35 BCM that was mentioned uh, uh, in the Repower EU plan, uh, I come to the conclusion that this is too low, too little. Uh, the Gas for Climate initiative showed that already by uh, producing biogas they can fulfill this requirement. Uh, we've seen the potential of gasification towards biomethane in Austria, which is 
is quite high. Uh, it does, it's not even needed uh, with the current uh, uh, targets. So my suggestion would be to double this at least in order to also promote the speed up of gasification based uh, green gas. Yeah, I think um, we have seen that this is a quite a complex question to answer. So there's not one answer to how to accelerate actually the market uptake. And this is because uh, we have so many aspects where we uh, see obstacles, well, as, as uh, Uwe has uh, presented that, uh, for the implementation. We have uh, substrates which, which come from different sectors which might have uh, utilization competition as it was uh, introduced here for, for Austria. Um, we have legislation, uh, either on the technology side, uh, permission for plans. This, this takes a while. It has been presented by the EU representative today that they want to speed up that process because it takes too long to implement these facilities. Uh, or might it be on the incentive side? Uh, uh, natural gas is now actually at a very similar level on the market price as, as renewable gas uh, from AD. But this wasn't the case uh, for a very long time, and that uh, competition uh, will not uh, be in favor for biomass as long as we, we are not talking about reasonable CO2 prices. And uh, to have uh, stable conditions, economic conditions, is, is very important for uh, the people who shall invest in such plans. Uh, trade was, uh, I think, the whole certification uh, issue is also a thing uh, that trade might help to develop the sector, cross-border trade, but then we need to align the incentives and uh, we need to have um, also certificates which, which make that uh, possible. Uh, I've already mentioned economy. Uh, I, I did a survey in the countries which are taking part in uh, IA Task uh, 37. And most of them said that financial reasons are the major reasons for the not having plans implemented. And I think this, this has to be clearly discussed. Uh, what is this worth to us? And then we need to actually set up uh, financial incentives which allow planned implementation. This is very important. I think I'm at the end of the panel. I'm apologizing actually for taking away 15 minutes of your lunch time, but uh, I think you will be able to manage that and uh, eat and uh, uh, increase the degradation rate uh, in your digestion process uh, in order to be here again at 1.15 when we continue with uh, presentations and also a panel discussion on liquid biofuels. Thank you very much.